Hello YouTube, it's Jim Bob Louie and today we are going to look at the separation between church and state. Now, when most of you guys think of the separation between church and state, what are the three things you think of most? Well, A, you think of God in the state, under God in the currency, and you think of Jesus being preached in schools. All right. So let's look at the history behind separation between church and state and then figure out if those three core things are still applicable for today. So the separation between church and state was originally made as the First Amendment. Now I don't have the First Amendment memorized unfortunately so I'm going to just read it. Bear with me. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government to readjust the grievances. Bleh. That's a mouthful. Let's look at the religious part, shall we? So the first part saying that the government shall not make one religion. This one is pretty much self-explanatory, saying that the government itself would not make a religion, and I'll explain this further on. And the second part says the government practically states the government will not step in to adjust a religion. This is also um, self-explanatory. The government in most cases will not interfere with one's religious beliefs. Why did I say most cases? Well, if you're dealing with human sacrificing, that the government will stop because that is just wrong in all accounts. And so in most cases, the government will not interfere with your religious beliefs. Now let's get back to the, the government shall not have one religion. You see, why, why would they put that in there? You see, it dates all the way back to King Henry VIII. Now we all know that King Henry VIII had six wives. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. Now, see, when he had the first wife, Catherine of Aragon, he wanted to divorce her. She didn't give him a boy that he wanted, so he was like, I'm going to divorce her. So he goes up to the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church at that point didn't believe in divorcing at all. And so the Pope, he said, no, you can't divorce her. King Henry VIII is like, I'm king. I'm going to do what I want. So he made his own church, the Church of England, which allowed him to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. See, the Church of English, England, English, the Church of England is still applicable today, just not as into the government as it was in the past. You see, the Church of England has three principles that in America, we do not have. Number one, the monarch, which is the queen at the moment, she is the absolute ruler of the church. Theoretically, Jesus is the head, right underneath it is the queen for the Church of England. The church could also make, it's part of the government, so it can make laws and destroy laws. And the third one is that the church itself Look at that. <laughs> the church and state are linked. I should have known that. I didn't have to look that one up. <laughs> okay, so this means that the church can make laws and the church could change laws. You know, that doesn't sound that bad. But you know the old saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And this is no different between any man. And so the church at that point had almost absolute power. And the church, at that point, was corrupted just a tad. You're like, James, how can you say that? Well, let me explain it this way. In a couple days, for me, and I think if I post this correctly, it would be either the day of, the day after, or before. Anyways, Thanksgiving time, right, woo, -hoo! pilgrims. Why did the pilgrims come to America? Well, you see, the pilgrims were in England, 
and they saw what the church was doing and they thought that it was not biblically standard. So they go up to the church and they try to say, hey, I don't think what you're doing is actually biblically sound. And you know what the Church of England did? They considered it treason and kicked the pilgrims out. That's absolute power right there. In America, treason is selling state secrets. Selling state secrets to get people killed. All they were doing was saying, I don't think what you're doing is biblically sound. If someone came up to me and said that and explained in the verses in the Bible why I sought biblically sound, and I prayed about it and God said, yeah, James, Jim Bob Louie, it's not sound at all. You need to change that up. I'll be like, oh my goodness, forgive me. Forgive me, Father. And I would go and apologize to the people that I have accidentally strayed. But the Church of England did not do that. No, the Church of England counted it as treason and kicked the pilgrims out. And they came to America and um, I think how the um, fable says they had Turkey with the Indians, the Native Americans. I don't know if that's actually historically accurate, but that's how I was taught. <laughs> I'm guessing it's not really that historically accurate. But I haven't studied up on that, so I can't give a definitive answer. Alright, what else, shall we? Well, if the church and state are not supposed to be connected, shouldn't we keep God out of it? The allegiance, pledge allegiance under God, and should we keep God out of the currency, and most importantly, should we keep Jesus Christ out of the schools? I'll tell you what, I also don't have these memorized, but I'll read you a couple of quotes from our founding fathers. The first one was, the first one is Je Thomas Jefferson and the reason why we have the First Amendment. Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or worship, that the legislative powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence the act of the whole American people which declared that their legislation should make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This building a wall of separation between church and state. So that was Thomas Jefferson in 1802. So basically separating church and state altogether. All right, let's see what Samuel Adams said. There is one above us who will take explanatory vengeance for every insult upon his majesty. You know that the cause of America is just. You know that she contends for that freedom to which all men are entitled, that she contends against oppression, repaying, and more than savage barbarity. The blood of the innocents is upon your hands, and all the waters of the ocean will not wash it away. We again make our solemn appeal to the God of heaven to decide between you and us, and we pray that in the doubtful scale of battle, we may successfully, as we have justice on our side, and that the more for savor of the world may forgive our oppressors. So Samuel Adams is saying, in the heat of battle, in war, we need to pray God to ask him to be on our side. So Samuel Adams, one of the founding fathers, believed that we should keep God in the military. All right, let's look at another quote for Samuel Adams. Let each citizen remember at the moment he is offering his vote that he is not making a present or compliment to please an individual, or at least that he ought not so to do, but that he is executing one of the most solemn trusts in human society for which he is accountable to God and his country. So Samuel Adams also believed in keeping God when we vote for the next president of the United States of America. I'm not going to get political, but I will say, pray when you vote. God will never lead you astray. James Madison says, we have, or said, technically, James Madison said, we have asked the whole future of, we have staked the whole future of our new nation, not upon the power of government, far from it. We have staked the future of our political constitutions upon the capacity of each of ourselves to govern themselves according to the moral principles of the Ten Commandments of God. So he's saying, keep God in the public. All right. George Washington, you know, one of the founding, founding fathers, the first president of the United States of America. He fought at the Battle of Waterloo. George Washington did amazing stuff, and he quotes, 
put it. It is impossible to govern the world without God and the Bible. Hmm. Of all the dispositions and habits that lead to political prosperity, our religion and morality are the indispensable supporters. Let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that our national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. So he's basically saying that the morality of America, what America stands for, peace, justice in the American way, freedom, what it stands for is based on biblical principles and that he says we cannot have those stances if it wasn't for God. One of my favorite quotes of the day is Benjamin Franklin. You know, key in the case, Benjamin Franklin. I have lived so a long time and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth. That God governs in the affairs of man and if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire cannot rise without his aid? Benjamin Franklin was quoting and saying that, is it possible that an empire, is it possible for America to rise without God's aid? No. Is it possible for America to decline without God's aid? Yes. Look around. God is always with us. But when we step aside and not do biblical principles, this is what happens. So I gave you evidence of why there was a separation between church and state. And I give you my opinion, yes, there should always be a separation between church and state. The church should never have the power to control the government and the government should never have the power to control the state. Now, do I believe that we need to keep God in our government? Yes. Why? George Washington stated that we can't govern without God. Do I need to think that we should keep under God in our currency? Yes. Why? Because if you look at it, heavens are above us, and America is underneath the heavens, and God is in the heavens, so we are technically under God. And last but not least, the one that is very contradictory, not contradictory, is very discussed upon both sides. Should we teach about Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, in the schools today? Coming from a Christian, I say yes. Coming from a history buff, I say yes. James, what are you talking about? History and Jesus, the Bible? Yes, historically, look it up. There was a man named Jesus, his last name wasn't Christ, that was his title. Jesus of Nazareth was born, died on a cross, and there was hundreds of people saw him rise again. Historically, that is accurate. So should we teach Jesus in history class? Since he was part of history, yes, we should teach Jesus. It'd be like saying, no, we cannot teach Napoleon Bonaparte because he is he tried to invade Russia and it failed. He, he died of, what was the theory? He died of wallpaper. No, we cannot, we cannot teach him in history class. Why? He's part of history. We need to learn our past to better our future. So with all that said, and I'm hoping I can get this out in time this time around. This is my second time making this video and I'm hoping it works out well. If you hear it to the end, thank you. You guys are amazing. Hopefully like, maybe subscribe, hopefully, God bless.